Hello and welcome back to Bar Chats and Viral Rights. My name is Jia Yao from the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar this afternoon. This webinar is part of a five episode series that aims to promote curiosity and healthy discussion about our right to be involved in the protection and management of our environment. This is a project by Malaysians for Malaysians. Our panelists are chosen not just because of what's on their name cards, but based on the value that the whole person can bring. The series is not about experts talking about specialist topics or the latest developments in the legal field. It is a series of panels where exceptional human beings sit down together and share their knowledge and experience on environmental justice with lay Malaysians. So last week, we kicked off this series with our prelude episode, which we called episode zero. In that episode, our panelists discussed whether ordinary people have the right to be upset with cases like Sungai Kim Kim and Sungai Gong. We discussed why it was important for us to direct our energy to the developing stories in such cases in order to effectively uphold and protect our rights. Flowing from our prelude episode, we are now ready to start with episode one. Where do environmental rights come from and what are they? So we have with us Lee Jin, who will be moderating today's session with me. Lee Jin is a consultant with a lot of experience in research and management consulting for the Malaysian government and other organizations. She's done work on the sustainable development goals, biodiversity financing, nature-based tourism, and more. Lee Jin is a Shivning scholar with a master's in environmental economics from Cranfield University. She was the university's sole rep for the Schmidt MacArthur Fellowship for Circular Economy during her year. She's published papers on ecology, one of which was included in one of Sir David Attenborough's documentaries. So she's oh. pretty awesome. Yes. Before we start, I would like to say, um, firstly, that the thoughts and opinions of our panelists are personal and do not, rep do not represent uh, the organizations that they're with. Uh, our webinars are meant to get people to ask more questions and better questions rather than to provide specific answers. So do not take anything mentioned here as legal advice for your specific situation. And lastly, we would love to hear from you. So please share your thoughts and questions with us via the Q&A function for those of you joining us on Zoom. For those on Facebook Live, please post them in the comments section. And you can use the hashtag, uh, the, the, the uh, hashtags bar chats and viral rights and BCECC. So I would now like to invite Lee Jin onto the virtual stage with me. Thank you, Lee Jin, for being part of this uh, project. Hi, morning, everyone. Thanks, JL, for having me. Hey, welcome here. So um, I think, Lee Jin, I'll uh, let you um, maybe tell us a little about what's the purpose of the episode today. Right. So hello, everyone. And um, today we are going to be looking at the legal Lego pieces, of which I have some Lego pieces here. <laughs> it's a celebration of all the many different sources we have that give us our environmental rights. Um, the purpose of which we need to know about our rights is that if we don't even know where the sources are, what gives us those rights to begin with? How do we even start exercising them? So we have with us today um, uh, another lady in red, um, Ms. Preeta Sankar. Um, and Preeta is an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya, the sole proprietor of her legal firm that focuses primarily on environmental law and policy oriented work. Um, she's been doing consultancy uh, and advocacy for over 15 years. She is also a UK Chipming scholar. Um, and focuses on environmental good governance. She was previously also a member of the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee, uh, as well as a columnist for Sun Daily for three years. Um, currently, she is the environmental legal expert for UNDP Malaysia, focusing on drafting of environmental law, rendering of legal opinions, and providing other technical legal and policy assistance to a number of projects. Um, across peninsula Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. We also have another um, heavyweight here, um, Emeritus Professor Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi, of which I will respectfully call Prof Shad. Um, Prof Shad is the holder of 
uh, Tunka Abdul Rahman Foundation Chair at University of Malaya and the NOAA Foundation Chair at the Un Institute of Strategic and International Studies Malaysia. He's the adjunct professor at Taylor's University Malaysia and a fellow of the Academy of Sciences. He is an author of 11 books, including Document of Destiny, the Constitution of the Federation of Malaysia. He's also written um, 600 articles and pre presented 500 seminar papers in 16 countries. He also pens a fortnightly column in The Star called Reflecting on the Law. He's currently, uh, he's form he was formerly a distinguished member of the Malaysian Judicial Appointments Commission, a member of the post-GE14 Institutional Reform Committee, and member of the Malaysia Agreement 63 Committee. In the past, he has held visiting and adjunct professorship in Indian and Australian institutions of higher learning and an associate professorship at University Islam Antarabangsa, Malaysia. So welcome to Prof Shad and Preeta. Thank you for joining us on the episode today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So I will kick off with a question um, directed to Prof Shad. From what I understand, the federal constitution is the highest law of the land. So is that where our environmental rights come from? Prof Shad. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I wish to say that I'm privileged to be with you all, and I thank the bar um, for this uh, invitation. I'm no expert in environmental law, but I'm a student of constitutional law. Now, uh, indeed, uh, you're right, Legion. The Constitution is the supreme law of the Federation. Um, it has. It is one of the world's longest constitution, Articles 1 to 183. But uh, sadly, our constitution does not have any specific or explicit provision on the environmental rights, or may I say, environmental duties of the citizens. But uh, lest this appears to be an um, undue criticism, let me say this, that actually the makers of the constitution the members of the Reed Commission were aware of the issues involving land, mining, agriculture, forestry. So these things are mentioned in the constitution, article 91. And uh, um, there is a um, national land council, which is supposed to take care of these things. Uh, it has not done a very good job up to now, but nevertheless, the constitutional scheme was that there would be a national land council, which would actually uh, be looking into national development plans, national development policies. And, and by the way, though we are a federal system, whereby powers are divided between the federal government and the state government, um, there is what could be called cooperative federalism. Under Article 76, the federal government can enter the state list where land is a matter in the state list to pass uniform laws. Uh, nevertheless, um, I have to say with sadness that there is no explicit right to a clean and healthy environment or the preservation of biodiversity or the conservation of nature. Um, we have nothing about the rights of future generations. I know this may sound a little bit new to some people. Uh, a developed legal system must not only provide for laws for the here and now, it must also look to the future. We have nothing about the rights of future generations. And we are indifferent to the rights, socioeconomic rights, which are referred to as the second generation rights, uh, right to drinking water, food, shelter, um, uh, these are not mentioned in our constitution. Mm -hmm. We are sadly uh, within a minority of nations without a constitutional protection. So should we wring our hands in despair? Uh, obviously not. I mean, this seminar itself is an indication that we are prepared to speak up. What, what can be done? 
Well, we have to resort to a prismatic interpretation of our constitution. We have to develop a jurisprudence, a philosophy of unenumerated, implied, non-textual rights. Now, so, I know- Bob, Can I just jump in sure. there and ask sure, you, sure. like, those were quite a few big terms there. Um, yeah. When you mean interpretation, you're saying that we actually need to interpret the constitution you in, order, in order for us to find our environmental rights somewhere in there. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and not just judges, you and me, social activists, administrators, I think we should look at the constitution, not just as black letter rules, but as signposts to guide the law, as some things which have a spirit and a soul. For example, um, Article 5 says, no person shall be deprived of life or liberty, save in accordance with law. Now, should the word life be interpreted literally to mean animal existence, being alive, breathing, excreting, sleeping? Or should the word life be interpreted to include livelihood? Life includes necessities of life. Life includes the quality of life. And I have to say this to you with some satisfaction. We do have some judges, like for example, in the Hong Leong decision, where the judge said that life includes a healthy and pollution free environment. In Tan Tek Seng, life includes livelihood. In Uttarabadi, similar sense, sentiments were expressed. Then the word liberty. Does liberty simply mean freedom from arrest? Or does liberty also include the right to go to the court? Now that's very important. When mm. people's rights are violated, environmental rights are violated, do we have a right to go to the court? You know, in a way, it could be mm. read into Article 5. Mm. to go to the so, Sugumar Balakrishna. Yes. So, Prof, so that means um, although we may not have the explicit uh, recognition of a right to a clean and healthy environment in our federal constitution, there are footholds in the constitution which uh, reflect um, parts of these rights to, to such a clean and healthy environment necessary for our well-being and for our life. And, and so I think your message is for us that... Uh, uh, to 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 read into the constitution and give it life right? indeed so there's indeed. some work to be done yes the whole concept of law mm. should not be the concept of law should not be confined to formal black letter rules law includes rules plus non rule standards by non rule mm. standards i mean principles of justice equity good conscience and in the case of environmental rights May I say that they should be read into our concept of life, liberty, and law. Because, uh, and here is where, Legion, please allow me. Um, this concept of environmental rights cannot simply be grounded in black letter rules. I think it's a transcendental, pre legal concept. Most of our religions recognize that this earth and all that's on it is actually a trust to us from God. Uh, for example, the Holy Quran says that the earth and everything in it is a creation of Allah. We are mere trustees. We have a duty to protect and take responsibility over the environment. The Old Testament in Exodus says, for six years, you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it and the wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. And just one more example, the Atharva Veda in Hinduism says that the earth is our mother and we are all her children. So given this fact that environmental respect is recognized by our religion. I think constitutional law, legislation about environmental rights and duties should take note of these transcendental sources of our law. Mm, I think profound, uh, really profound, Professor. I think what you've identified, we were looking for, what's the first Lego piece? But I think what you've pointed to is that big 
piece of Lego board that you build on top of, um, which is not only the constitution, but you have also actually pointed to the other pieces of, of legitimacy, maybe, uh, maybe canonical, uh, what, what do you, is that religious yes, law? Yes, yeah, sure, right? sure, sure, and, why and, not? And, and, and philosophy and, and things. So um, I think we've identified some, some the fundamental piece there um, uh, relating to the constitution that we have. Now I want to turn to Preeta uh, on maybe to the next Lego piece to use that to use that uh, metaphor that we are using here. Um, maybe Preeta can tell us about a, a bit from a national um, perspective. Um, maybe what are the uh, policies and plans? Um, do they, you know, uh, do you see them as sources of laws for us? Thanks, Jayo. Um, if I may, I just want to jump into the first Lego piece, just, just mm. very quickly, very, very quickly. Just to say that, it, as you mentioned, there were footholds for interpretation of, of environmental rights from federal constitution, and as Prof has mentioned it. Um, there's also a piece called Arriving at that Discourse, as assuming their attempts to now draw it into the constitution more expressly. It's a very difficult discourse to have. The only reason is being because it is there are value perspectives attached to it. So the value perspective when it comes to the environment, there are actually two that are very prominent now. One's known as an ecocentric perspective. That means you put the environment first and then people who come from that particular perspective. And then you have the anthropocentric perspective. So people say environment exists for, for mankind and you put man first. So whether there is areas for convergence and confluence between two rights is some of the difficulties you will have sometimes drawing words into the federal constitution and then later attempting to interpret it. So it's a very complex discussion when you start talking about it at that level. I just wanted to mention that it's guided by and it's influenced by a lot of the um, value perspectives attached for, to it and depending on where you come from uh, in that sense. Um, back to your question on the policies, I think there'd be, there, there would need to be a context, right, and why we're going to talk about uh, policies today. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I was to set a context and tell the participants, um, go back to Malaysian policies, especially as they relate to the environment, what would the purpose be? Let's establish that purpose um, for now. Um, I think if you're going to draw it in, in terms of environmental rights and national policies, I don't think it would be too tenuous to say that knowledge is power here. So the more we're able to appreciate where the federal government or the national government places its priorities when it comes to the environment, what are some of the obligations, what are some of the commitments that it has, it has promised to do, it will be good to go to the national policies as a standpoint, rather than simply saying we have a right to a clean environment or water, because it goes into very subjective areas of the law. How clean do you want it, for example? How clean yes. should it actually be, for example, right? But if you want a real concrete policy direction, then go to the policy documents. Um, I think the starting point would be the National Policy on Environment. It was drafted way back in 2002. Um, I don't think it's been revised since then. So I think it's still operative. It comes under the purview of the now Ministry of Environment and, and, and Water. It gives you an idea of some of the guiding principles that Malaysia has alluded to in terms of environment and more importantly, sustainable development. We've heard this this word was um, probably the buzzword late, what, right throughout the 90s. We don't seem to hear a lot of it now, but the premise of that policy at that time was sustainable development. So go then and have a look at what some of the principles in relation to the environment is, just to get an idea of where Malaysia is framing its environmental uh, commitments. That would be really good to, to know. The other place to create that. Yes, can please. I just quickly jump in there as we have a question from the audience um, okay. where they were saying that, you know, there's a general consensus that the planet whole, as a whole is facing severe climate ch change challenges um, and there's an urgent need for everyone to do that. Can we, you know, submit some sort of action plans so that Malaysia not only catches up with best environmental practices and can contribute to efforts to curb climate change challenges, etc. So when you're talking about national policies, um, it seems to me that you, 
that is our action plan. Actually, that's that's where the the concrete part, what we are supposed to do, is. Is that correct? Am I understanding correctly? It is correct, but the the only issue to that is policies are not self implementing. So you would need uh, action plans and strategies, and more importantly, you would need to identify the infrastructure within which it would be implemented. And that would be yeah. the machinery from your ministries to your departments to agencies ultimately so the so, ambition in terms of how to uh, implement environmental rights is in the policy but then from the policy then actually you draw out other things like the action plans and strategies yes i mean you so, can see yes. an evolution of our policy in that sense so if you've had national environmental policy way back in 2002 you come back to one that's a little bit more recent that was launched in 2015 which is the national policy on biological diversity. For me, it's a more stringent policy. And why I say that is because when you look at the policy, it's very goal based, you actually have targets that Malaysia wants to reach in terms of species protection and protected areas and pollution index and water quality. So you, it's very stringent in that sense. So it's got very specific goals. And it goes into criteria and even indicators of how we're supposed to meet those goals. So it gives you a little bit more of what the implementation ideas are, but not necessarily the full implementation framework. But I would think that the policies would be a good place to, to start to really get a holistic picture of where Malaysia is coming from in terms of the national agenda as well as how it's influenced from the environmental international agenda as well so the policies are a good place to start yes mm -hmm. okay and so um so the policy so we've identified policies as well and and uh so then policies will inform legislation would that be at the next lego piece Prita? yeah do mm -hmm. they have actually force of law i think that's what does I it was... work that way <laughs> I, was worried, I was worried about that too. Uh, Prita, you said policies supply the impetus. It should be the law that supplies the impetus. Policy must be under the law, yes. uh, being driven by the law rather than driving the law. Because I'm sorry to say this, in many other areas of human rights, policy is more important than the law, and that should not be so. Yes. In citizenship provisions, for example, the Constitution says one thing. But the National Registration Department has its policies and they are above the Constitution. Yes. That right. should not be so. Yes, that's right. What's so in terms of mm. the policies, uh, Prof, is that some of the policies actually refer to explicit drafting of environmental and sector based laws as well. That means they've noticed the gap. And as you said, the policy tends to inform. Uh, where some legislation is, is desired as well. We would also like law to inform policy, but in the environment sphere, it tends to work both ways. It's difficult to say whether one influences the other or the other directly influences. No. Uh, as long as the policy, as long as the policy doesn't violate the law, that's all right. Mm, mm. As long as it provides impetus to the law for further growth, that's fine. Uh, my, my fear is that this principle that policy is the basis, uh, that is dangerous because actually in a rule of law society, the policy must be under the law, not the law under the policy. Mm. So Prof has made a, 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 a poignant uh, 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 clarity there. So I think this is what we are talking about with Prita here, yeah. which is uh, in, the, in the absence or in the uh, intention of developing the law uh, to protect our environment, um, there are these policies, the, the two examples that Prita has provided, and those uh, perhaps have guided some uh, the, the directions for, for uh, new laws, to be, uh, new legislations uh, to plug the gaps that we have in our legal system, right, Prita? Yes, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, those are just the tip of the iceberg uh, policies. You have sectoral policies as well, the national forestry policy, for example, that was drafted way back in the uh, 1970s, provided a lot of impetus to how we actually classify permanent forest reserves, for example, and then we've had a lot of discourse on protected areas coming from there. So it's not, the end goal is not necessarily laws as well, there are a lot mm. of management effectiveness, which, which 
which uh, influences governance, which influences a lot of management regimes as well. So the policies have a multitude of purposes, at least in the environmental context, it has multitude of purposes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have the national climate change. Yeah, the example you mentioned there just now, uh, national forestry policy, but I, I sort of remember there's also something called National Forestry Act. So, so how, what, what then is like the difference between this sort of act and the, that's a formal law, I'm guessing, and then... Yes, you're right. There is a National Forestry Act. It's fundamentally a commodities-based legislation, which basically attempts to arrive at uniformity in relation to forestry and the governance of forests in the state. Mm. Uh, what the policy led to, and I think there was a review of the policy in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, which added the dimension of the need to uh, do some level of protection for example. So it led to a system of classification of forests within the National Forestry Act. Though I do have to point out here that we say it's a National Forestry Act, but it has to be adopted by the states and applied in the states as state legislation in order for it to apply. And that was in accordance with articles in the federal constitution, article 76. If I'm 76, not. yeah. 76. I on my uh, FC, which promoted the uniformity of law. So the National Forestry Act was one of those laws that were passed under that particular uh, clause as well. It doesn't apply to Sabah and Sarawak, but all the states in Peninsula Malaysia have adopted it and apply it as um, state legislation, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, ju I just want to uh, have a finger on the pulse of the, the purpose of our episode one. So, so far we're doing great. Um, uh, picture we have a basket where we're collecting these legal pieces. The first one, uh, Prof has laid down for us, um, federal constitution, and then even the more profound things that guide us, like, like our religion, and, and the uh, philosophy, for example. And then we've got um, policies, we've got plans, we've got legislation. Now, uh, I just saw a question that's come in um, that, that says, may I know how to gazette a green park for our residency area? Thank you. Now, again, so this is, this is our webinar is not to answer questions like this, but I think this is an opportunity for, to, for us to talk about gazetting and how does that fit in, in terms of what, what are these legal pieces that, that is involved? Maybe Preeta, you can you can uh, take that one. Well, if I could guess at anything, I would. <laughs> so you know, it's really up to uh, public pressure, mm. that, right? Uh, as requiring protection, right? And um, gazettes used very loosely for that for that um, uh, in the layperson's language, gazette is used to to you know to connote that there needs to be legal protection offered in, to that particular. Mm. So you have um, um, the structure plans, local plans, which I think we'll talk about in a bit. But the avenue now, when people tend to talk about uh, protection, it's mostly through the National Forestry Act, through the classification of permanent forest reserves, and that's gazetted, and you're, you, you are gazetted as a permanent forest reserve, or in some instances, you're gazetted as state parks. That's what states use. Then you have other other tools. National Land Code, for example, can reserve an area for a public purpose. Then you have mention of it in the structure plans, in the local plans. It doesn't necessarily have the force of law behind it, but it's it's some kind of entrenchment to re towards recognition that that area is important for conservation, per se. Um, so gazettement purely within the states. Um, um, purview to, to do that as they see fit, depending on what that area's uh, purpose is for, in that sense. Mm, mm. So I think Prita has alluded to uh, sort of this, I think you've hinted at the, uh, some, a bit more complexity here, there's the federal laws and then the state laws and the state processes. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about this um, after shortly, but um, yeah, but Legion, maybe we want to talk about the, the, the other legal piece. Yeah, actually, I wanted to jump in right there and now uh, direct the question to Prof Shad. Um, so I've also heard of this term called judge-made law. Actually, what is what is judge-made law? Well, um, the Constitution of Malaysia in Article 160, Clause 2, recognizes three sources of law. Written law, by which is meant laws passed by Parliament or the State Assemblies. Number two, common law, which is actually judge-made law. 
uh, judge made law both in England, English judges, and there are civil law act and our local judges. And thirdly, custom to the extent recognized. Now, uh, why should judges judges make law? Well, the answer to that is this, uh, that it is not the task of judges to make law in the sense of, in the sense of passing statutes, no. But judges have to interpret the law. And in interpreting the law, in a way, you are making law because you are giving to a word a life and a meaning it may not have had. Uh, I, earlier, I was mentioning to you the meaning of the word life or liberty or law. For example, uh, two years ago, uh, in a hallmark decision, the judges said, Law doesn't mean any law whatsoever. Law means a law that is proportionate, that is reasonable. So judge-made law basically is, most of the time, basically what it is, is, is an interpretation of the existing law, but with a moral blue pencil, if I may put it that way. You see, no law can ever be complete. So when a case comes up before the courts, the judges have to apply the law, but sometimes the law has gaps. So what should the judge do? Should the judge wring her hands in despair and say, hey, there's no law, you guys have to go back, go and knock on the doors of parliament. Or should the judge reach out into the heart of legal darkness uh, and from there extract some raw materials. By raw materials, I, I, I don't mean something bad. I mean, the seminal sources of law, religion, morality, ethics, justice, equity, reasonableness, natural justice. The judge relies on those and fashions a signpost to guide the law. So in that respect, the judge does contribute to the law. Um, and uh, decisions like Tan Tech saying, um, uh, may I just uh, read to you from Tan Tek Singh. Um, this would be relevant to interpretation. The judge says, the expression life appearing in Article 5, Clause 1 does not refer to mere existence. It incorporates all those facets that are an integral part of life itself and those matters which go to form the quality of life. Now, I think that's just interpretation, but how can you say it is not lawmaking? The judge is adding moral colors because we rely on the doctrine of binding judicial precedent. This decision by the judge survives for the future and thereby actually brick by brick, the legal system grows. That's judge made law. Fantastic, brick by brick. So in our basket, we're collecting uh, a few more pieces now. That's our fourth piece, if I'm counting. Now the next um, next complexity to this, uh, Preeta, we're coming back to the uh, state and federal law um, difference here. Um, uh, it, it, we also have a question that's kind of related, right? Um, maybe we look at the question and then you could, from there, you could uh, have a discussion about this in the context of federal and state dichotomy. Uh, this, this question is to Prof. Shah and to Preeta. A large number of natural resources are on the state list of the federal constitution. Do you think this is a roadblock to effective environmental or biodiversity management? Let me discuss this because I also want to use this to identify the next kind of block because uh, we, we talked about uh, laws, but uh, uh, legislation, well, that would be parliamentary legislation, federal at federal level, then there's the state part. And then maybe we can point to the difference between the state law and then there's federal law. But um, on to the question, maybe. First to yeah. the question. Yeah, actually, it's a very tough question because um, in 1956, 57, when the Reed Commission was drafting the Constitution, uh, surprisingly, they were quite conscious of this problem that land is in the state list that is in the hands of the state governments, state legislature, and yet there are issues of logging, land clearance, sand mining, litter, earthworks, town planning, uh, which will have implications for the whole nation. If you dirty a river upstream, actually all the way down, uh, the impact is there. So it, is, it cannot be confined just to the borders of the state. So I think they were quite conscious of this fact that uh, we need to have federal state division of power. And yet 
there is need for unified management. Mm. I'm sorry to report, however, that uh, it hasn't worked that way. Uh, even though the unified management, management was supposed to be through the NLC, National Land Council. Article 92, national development is in federal hands. Uh, uh, Preetap men mentioned just now Article 76, uniformity of laws. It hasn't quite worked that way because um, land is one of the biggest sources of income in the hands of the states. Not just in the hands of the states, in the hand of state entrepreneurs, <laughs> in the hands of the elite. And therefore, they do not want too much interference from the federal government. So sadly, there is a little bit of a, um, a commercial issue here. What needs to be done is not being done because lots of people have vested interest. So I, I, uh, I, I fully agree with you that the issue of separation of powers between federal and state government uh, is very difficult, partly because environment is a huge issue and it is holistic. It cannot be separated into land is in your hand, logging is in your hand. Uh, actually, it's all connected. Maybe if we uh, can add a little bit also on, I mean, based on your experience with various consulting works uh, with the Malaysian government, um, also the dynamics that as Prof. Chad has already pointed out, how, how, how does it look? Uh, like, can you give us an example on, on the ground of how it looks between this federal and state law? On the ground, Legion, I mean, thank you for that question. I mean, somebody, you know, is obviously thinking about this and I allude to what um, Prof said, you know, it's, it's led to a lot of problems in relation to fragmentation, a lot of decision-making fragmentation. It's very, very difficult to coordinate the, the things that we talked about earlier, the policies. So the policies have a lot of measures and strategies, but they require the cooperation of the state to, to, especially as it relates to land and forest, to make a lot of those measures successful. Um, let me give you an example. We have a law that we drafted in 1980. It's known as the National Parks Act. Now, the idea of a National Parks Act, um, if, if, you, if you guys would like to venture a guess, how many parks do we have under this law? Just take a guess, Jaya. Would you like to just shoot out a number and say? Oh dear. Mm, say 20? Oh no. <laughs> I say one. One since 1980. And the reason is because the notion, the presumption and fears that once you, you declare a national park that fundamentally falls under the jurisdiction of the federal government, what you are doing is you're surrendering that piece of land. Right. That piece of the federal government to manage. And right. so, Prita, are you telling me that Taman Negara is actually not Taman Negara? Like... No, Taman Negara is not one of those parks that are declared or protected under this National Parks Act. So that's oh. the problem with environmental laws in Malaysia. There's so much overlap in terms of terminology and usage that people tend to get a bit confused about what exactly is federal, what is national mean, and what is state. There's a lot of confusion, and that's what I meant about fragmentation. So mm. fragmentation, even in terms of use of terminology, mm. but you can't really implement policies that impact land and forest and other resources that are within the state's purview. And then you have, even if you do attempt to enact laws, if there is even a notion that you're surrendering lands to the federal government to manage, states would not welcome it in their state. So since 1980, there's only one small park in Penang that's been declared under this in this uh, particular act. So you can see that the amount of control that the state still wishes to assert over its natural resources is very, very, very strong. So but I'm sure that's for, in, in some sense, to protect the state as well. Um, Absolutely. That's why we have such a separation. The right to econo the economic development of the state and the right to exploit their natural resources. And that's... Mm. Would there also be some sort of check and balance as well to make sure, you know, if, if federal goes haywire, at least the state can have some control. Or if the state goes haywire, at least federal can have some control. 
Well, <laughs> it's all a matter of money sometimes, Lee Jenny. Right? Ah, exactly. It's a matter. Yeah. Actually, I was going to say that part of the reason why the states are so jealous, rightly so, about their rights over land and mining and forest is because though we are a federal state, we have no fiscal federalism. The sharing of revenues between the federal and state governments is very uneven, except in relation to Sabah Sarawak, where things are slightly better. I, uh, yeah. I'm told that I'm told that for every one ringgit that the federal government earns in taxes and other sources of revenue, all the states combined earn only 10 sane. Can you believe that? One federal government earns, let us say, 100 ringgit in taxes and other sources of income, uh, immigration, import, export duty. All the states combined together earn only 10 ringgit to the... So that's why the states don't have enough money to operate their government and they insist and whatever was given to them in 1957 should not be taken away or should not be regulated. Mm. Mm. So that, mm. that brings uh, me back to uh, our episode zero example of Sungai Kim Kim. It's, uh, I understand then the civil suit at that time, it wasn't just a um, uh, federal department of the uh, Department of Environment that was named, but also the state government and as well as uh, so when we talk about this dichotomy between federal and state, um, it's because of this situation. That's why in a civil suit like Sunai Kim Kim, you would have to name all these pieces, right? Because essentially even the business operation of that private company that polluted is in the state government's hand or the local council's hand to say cancel or not cancel. And the federal government actually can't do that. Am I correct? It points to the issue of accountability and who wants to take responsibility for what's gone wrong in Sunai Kim Kim. Of course, right. it's another episode altogether, especially when you talk about <laughs> pollution into rivers. There's a lot of complexity associated with, with agencies that are involved and, and um, um, multiple overlaps between legislation as well. But mm. going back to your question, Legion, is that it's a carrot and stick situation with this with the states you know the, the stick is not going to work because the power of the constitution is with the states so you have to offer incentives to the states if it is to conserve natural resources there's got to be um, an opportunity cost here for the states to give up the area which they could otherwise economically develop so unless you put compensation if you don't like the word compensation, if incentives are not put across the table for states, I don't see why they would, would come on board. This is some of the issues that we need to tackle at the federal level. You really have to start talking about um, a compensation scheme and an incentive scheme to get states, especially as it relates to opportunities that they're losing from conserving land and forests onto the table. Yeah, it's a very important factor. So, yeah, building on this uh, discussion we have here, we have a question from Visagan Krishna Murthy in our audience, and he asks, can city council actually devise their own policies to combat environmental issues on an individualistic level, such as mandatory recycling, extensive use of non-biodegradable plastic, um, which I, I, I think I'm going to pass that probably over to Jaya because he, he is going to lead you on into the next piece, I think, <laughs> relating to development and planning. Uh -huh. mm. So yeah, maybe maybe we can talk about uh, uh, Visagan's question on whether local council can come up with their own. Well, he, his asked question was policies, but maybe he means laws as well. Let, let's, let's assume he means both, yeah? to combat mm. environmental issues within their local uh, uh, jurisdiction. So um, maybe, uh, I, you know, let's, let's discuss this in the in context of um, your, something more in terms of practical to, to the uh, lay person in terms of uh, development and planning type situations. So let's say uh, you just found out that there is a uh, landfill, for example, that is now scheduled to be uh, set up um, uh, you know, just, just a stone's throw away from where you live. 
so um, you know what can you do so because well um, uh, the population in your in your town has been growing the old landfill has been filled up they need a new place and hey, there's a nice empty space here near you and uh, the local council uh, after considering everything decides to have a new landfill there so what can you do as a lay person uh, as, a, as a let's say let's say your residence association to to kind of um, um, have feedback or have a say in this be pretty tough. My, my impression is that we do we do have a right to citizens do have a right to have a hearing um, we have a right to protest but my personal experience has been um, actually much of that is uh, a, a facade uh, they'll put up a notice by the side of a road uh, by, by there I mean the local authority by the side of a road uh, which is uh, fast moving so nobody's gonna <laughs> <laughs> stop to watch the notice uh, and then they they do invite you if you are object if you seek uh, a hearing they invite you but at the end of the hearing that's it uh, they do what they have to do uh, mm. and they are they are unafraid because they are not elected they don't bother what you think because their office does not depend on your vote they have been appointed so though the law is federal these are state appointees and the patronage is basically the patronage of the state so basically what happens is this also let me mention this to you i found this out as a as a student of law they are required to have their local authority meetings open to the public they do the only thing that happens is this all the major decisions are made in committees elsewhere and then at the local authority meeting what happens is the decisions are reported and endorsed so basically they go through the the facade mm. of you and i being present but actually the real decisions were made at committee level which committees are not open to the public. So I think the right. Local Government Act has to be amended. Not only the meetings of the council, local authority, but the meetings of the committees must also be open to us. Right. So let's identify that piece, uh, misshapen or unwieldy or useless as it is. Um, that piece here sounds like, so there are some regulations where uh, that govern the making of these decisions. Yes. Uh, albeit after uh, behind closed doors, parts of it require public consultation. Yes. Um, um, parts of it um, of allow opportunities for public intervention or, or participation. So where are those windows? Um, and so, what kind of laws are those? So, you know, f uh, keeping focus on on the on the identifying these legal pieces, these pieces of law. Um. The Town and Country Planning Act is perhaps one of those very few pieces of legislation that actually have uh, prescriptions that relate to the public to participate. Mm -hmm. So the participation directly relates to whenever a draft local plan or a structure plan is in place, then there's a requirement on the uh, director to actually put out a notice and say, look, we have a structure plan, a draft structure plan, we have a draft local plan, depending on, on which one comes first, and that we require public input. So it is one of those very rare pieces of, of legislation that actually call for active input. There is a requirement to display the structure plan, the local plans. It invites uh, comments on the plan. You're able to have photographs and maps accompanying it. And then it gives you an idea of what some of the proposed development plans are. So when, when the state talks about development plans at a local level, this is what they mean. It's in the structure plan and in the local planning. Now, once you submit your comments, where there's a window for you to submit those comments, as Prof says, how they take into consideration and whether they do take that into consideration and how it's factored in the final uh, draft before it's sent to the committee for approval is something that we don't know. And that's, I think, what Prof says that we should have uh, transparency on. Mm -hmm. 
specific is through the draft structure and local plans. I think it's somewhere around section six or seven in the Town and Country Planning Act, which is which is quite uh, uh, quite uh, advanced for its time because it was drafted way back in 1976. So the opportunities to participate is found there. Limited. Right. The process is good. The only problem is there is a difference between consultation and consent. They don't require our consent. They just require to consult. They consult and they say, thank you very much. No. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. So it is a very small window through which to, to push your views and in your, but then what happens behind that is really beyond your reach. But, mm. but that's, that's the value here. It's like we're trying to identify all these pieces, um, um, yeah, limited as they may be. So we've got so far, we've covered, um, um, we've covered very quickly, very briefly, we've uh, looked at the constitution, we've looked at policies and plans, we've looked at uh, parliamentary law legislations, we've looked at judge-made laws, um, we've discussed a little bit about the complexity and the, and the challenges between the federal and the state uh, 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 dichotomy, that, that difference there, and how uh, the uni uh, uniforming uh, the laws. And we've also touched here a little bit on uh, um, development and planning law in a, in a very, very short context. Um, I'm just going to side fall there yeah. quickly and yes, ask Legion. a question. Mm. Um, how about like international stuff? Um, is that something that we, we can find our environmental rights in? So I don't know, treaties, obligations, commitments, laws. Any example? Actually, the the... Go ahead, go ahead, Frita. Go ahead. No, no problem. You first. I'll follow Thank you. your lead. Uh, actually, in this age of globalization, and not just globalization, uh, let, let's be very frank, we are possibly facing um, an environmental catastrophe. All mm. of us around the world. So I think this is a, a matter which cannot be ignored. So in this age of globalization, there is surely a wealth of laws um, from the Stockholm Conference of 1972 which I understand 177 out of 193 UN members uh, recognize that there is a right to a healthy environment. There's a great deal of international law from the law of the sea to the space law. The main problem is this, that many legal systems and ours is one of them, uh, has this dualistic theory of law as opposed to monistic. In other words, international law is a separate system Municipal law is a separate system, dualism, and the two are separate and independent. So if Malaysia signs an international treaty, in international courts, in its relationship with other nations, it is bound by that law. But I cannot go to the local courts with the help of JIA and sue them for violating international law. Because sadly, in the Article 160, Clause 2, International law is not recognized as law. We have a dualistic theory of law. However, my personal view is this, that our judges must, as far as possible, move away from it. Um, in England, parliament is supreme. International law cannot override national law, but the judges have for a very long time developed a constitutional presumption that the law of parliament does not intend to violate international law unless it says so explicitly. So I think our judges should do the same. They should adopt international law as far as possible. And I'm fortified in my uh, hope and belief because article 160 clause two, which defines law says law includes, it doesn't say law means law includes legislation, sorry, written law, common law, custom. So judges are being active and actually relying on the presumption that uh, our legislation is supposed to be in line with international law. Thank you for that, Prof. Shad. And I have a question from uh, the, the audience from Noriani. And she was asking if there is no specific law or act um, that has been decided, let's say it's a new problem. Um, it's a new issue, it's a current issue. How are our judges or lawyers going to try and tackle that matter? 
um, you know, uh-huh. maybe it's something that the law hasn't even talked about yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I really don't think that's, uh, uh, that's a major problem. Uh, li- life is always larger than the law. And no law can be comprehensive. I'll just give you an example. Article 5, Clause 1 says that no person shall be deprived of life or liberty save in accordance with law. Article 5 says nothing about the prisoner's family having the right to visit him. Article 5 doesn't say anything about uh, a prisoner being allowed uh, for law, temporary leave to go attend, let us say, a funeral or his child's graduation. Now, these are things that can be read into the law, either by way of delegated legislation or sometimes judges. Judges have said family visits are part of the right to life. So I would like to uh, tell Noriani, actually, judges are doing that all the time. They don't want to admit it. They are reading the law creatively. So um, let me just give you a silly example. Um, let, let us say uh, on uh, Chinese uh, New Year Day, uh, a young lady received a few thousand ringgit uh, in, by way of angpa. Is that income for purpose of income tax? Is that income? No. <laughs> well, the, the judges have to interpret the income tax act to say uh, yes. income basically means something that is recurring, expected, not a windfall. So judges have to interpret. The point is the statute, the income tax act doesn't say anything about duet raya and angfao that you receive or my son got eight A's, so I gave him 100 ringgit per A. That's not income. So I, I go back to my point, life is always larger than the law and judges should not wring their hands in despair. They must as far as possible uh, try to interpret the law in such a way as to fill the gaps. Uh, in, in England, that's how the common law developed. In England, they didn't even have a penal code. The criminal law of England developed primarily by way of judge-made law. Contract law developed by way of judgment law. I know we are slightly different, but nevertheless, there is no way on earth that judges can avoid filling the gaps in the law. Of course, they don't want to admit. That's all right because of the doctrine of separation of powers. Uh, people say, oh, you're not supposed to make the law. Mm. Uh, I, I'm happy if they add moral colors, but they don't want to admit that's all right with me, as long as they add moral <laughs> colors. Right. Thank you, Prof. Shad. So on that note, I'd like to direct it now to Preeta. Um, it seems like there is a lot of avenue for dynamism, change. Um, regardless, it seems like interpretation is a common thing that we've talked about here. Um, it seems like, you know, this opportunity for us to influence something is there, just whether or not it gets undertaken. Um, but why is it important for like ordinary citizens like like me, who is not lawyer based, legal based, to actually tell our part of the story using all these various Lego pieces that we've identified in this episode? Why is it important for us to actually bring it out? Maybe Preeta you can comment on Because this is your future, Legion. This is your future. And how well we take care of our environment and our natural resources is really the insurance plan, isn't it, for for generations to come? Um, Yes. So at the the rate of deforestation, at the rate that we are losing ecosystems, we are losing species, we've got species that have gone extinct in Malaysia in the last 5, 10, 15 years. We're on the brink of losing our tigers. We're at the brink of our fisheries coming close to collapse. Our rivers are polluted. Um, We have fragmentation of forests happening. Large tracts of lands are are disconnected from protected areas. We still have erosion, sedimentation, not to forget climate change. So it's important for all of us, for all our welfare, for future generations, for, for us to find ways in which we can make our voice heard but the issue is how do we make them heard that what that was the 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 question today i wish i had the answers to to all of them i can only point to some of the opportunities that we do have i I don't think we, we have time to talk about more i'm not sure today but um 
just going back to your question very quickly on international treaties, Legion, earlier, there is value, but there are two dimensions to that value. First of all, you have the environmental international treaties themselves, which have contributed to conservation related legislation in this country. That's purely on the conservation realm of it. So your biosafety laws, your, your laws on the convention of the illegal trade in flora and fauna, most popularly known as the CITES legislation, um, access and benefit sharing. These are the three most prominent laws that have come out from obligations that Malaysia has signed on at the international level. Besides that, there's a lot of moral persuasion, there's a lot of prescriptive value, there's a lot of directional value coming from a lot of these treaties, especially as they relate to your procedural rights. If there was any document that anyone needs to go to, we call it a source document, right, in, in the Malaysian context, if you need a source document to see where your procedural rights can come from and where they stem from, I would ask everybody to go to the Rio Declaration. Malaysia signed on to that declaration in 1992. It, have, it was a seminal declaration, which for the first time actually formulated the link between human rights and the environment in procedural terms. And very quickly, what that actually means is, do you have a right to meaningfully participate in environmental decision-making? One closely connected to that, do you have access to information? Information has to be easy, region. It has to be easy, it has to be accessible, it has to be available. And thirdly, of course, is the third element that we talked about, which is the access to justice. So have we set up enough procedurally for even these three elements to be uh, satisfied? I think we have a long, 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 long way to go. Uh, Thank you, Rita, for that, yeah. And it's interesting because you made that point because on uh, our audience, there's an anonymous attendee who actually asked the possibility of um, having a law to actually make our local assemblymen or MPs hold regular meetings with the constituents to deal with their concerns about local environmental issues. Now, we probably can't address that question. I'm mindful of the time here, um, but that is something that we <laughs> can um, discuss further in our coming episodes. I'll pass the floor back to Jaya. Yeah, in fact, uh, I was going to refer to that question as, oh. the, as the closing one because I, I, I thought it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about, uh, it flows on from what Prof and Peter were saying about, um, you know, um, being engaged, uh, being, being participatory. So I think um, that question was like, you know, asking like, can we have a law for, for, to force our MPs and or our state aduns to, to, to listen to us and have meetings with us? Uh, I think show that information. Yeah. and show information, right, and to respond to questions and and to and to give information, but not just any information, but useful information, timely, right, uh, to to allow people to participate. Um, so maybe can I, uh, you know, we've we've been taking questions along as we have with uh, as uh, throughout this webinar. So I think we are uh, already five minutes uh, uh, past five. Can I invite uh, Prof and Prita to um, give your your closing remarks before we wrap up the, today's webinar. Yeah. I'll let Prof take this one first. Okay, thank so you I'll very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think um, my sentiment is that the citizens want to participate. There's no one who will tell you, look, I don't want to participate. So I think the opportunity here is to really create that platforms for the exchange of information, for that discourse to happen. A lot more has to happen. If we can make this, this um, chat today afternoon work, we've got uh, more outreach than we've ever had before. We've got the media, we have social media. There are so many ways in which you can reach the citizens. It's a question of creating meaningful platforms to engage. It's really that question. It's no longer, it has to have decentralization at all levels. All levels have to look at decentralization when it comes to environmental decision making. So I think in wrap up, what I'd like to see if you're going to talk about rights is really to create that avenues to effectively participate. We didn't get a chance to talk about the environmental impact assessments today. That would be a great place to start when we start talking about effective participation. Jaya, who knows, maybe in your next, 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 next series that you're doing, you could dedicate 
different series just to talk yes. about how do we make this a lot more meaningful for the person who is choosing to participate. People give their time in providing input and, and giving out their concerns. People are invested in this process. So if you have persons who are invested, then create those avenues for them to participate. Go to the media, go to your MPs, use all avenues that are possible, but make sure at all times that it's constructive, it identifies a problem, it's constructive, and this is uh, basically the solution that you think might apply. Don't just complain, 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 such a lot. You know, then the government mm -hmm. really not very keen to hear you. But if mm -hmm. you go in with a, with a positive, constructive way of doing things, I think there's possibility and we can arrive at some meeting point. That would be the last last point for me this evening. Right. Yeah. And Prasha? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to say something earlier, which I didn't uh, get to say. Uh, this session was about environmental rights. I would like to remind all our learned participants that rights go hand in hand with duties. Actually, this session is equally about environmental duties. We should not for a moment think that the duties that we were talking about belong only to, to the legislature or the executive. You and I actually have a duty to protect the environment and I have to say this uh, with concern that many of us are aware of our own rights, but are rather indifferent to our duties. The first function of freedom should be actually to protect the rights of others. Uh, uh, I think that would be the most uh, important thing. Now, uh, so that's about rights and duties. They must go hand in hand. We all must observe our duties and not just about our rights. Now, coming to rights, um, lawyers here will, of course, know that there are legal remedies available. They are expensive. They are dilatory. They, they, they take time. Uh, I would like to emphasize that all of us, must try to employ whatever non-legal, non-judicial remedies may be available. Please approach your NGO, your uh, consumer association. Please write letters to the newspaper. Please approach your MP, go to his service center if he has a service center. And please raise your concerns because as we said earlier, government often if not often, <laughs> not just often, most of the time, government doesn't act, it reacts. It reacts to ideas that have been galloping around the outskirts of the legal system for a long time. And then only the doors will be open to let the idea come in. So please uh, assert yourself. Freedom and rights are never given on a platter, never. Even in a democracy, they have to be they have to be fought for. You have to struggle for them. And please, and that's my last uh, thing to say, um, don't wait for the law to make us free. We have to make the law free, free of its assumptions, structural injustices and prejudices. So uh, it's not the law that will make us free. It's we that will make the law free. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Shah, and thank you, Preeta. Um, and thank you to our participants, really, for putting in uh, so many questions. Uh, we apologize that we can't go through all of them. Uh, we've got questions from Facebook as well. Uh, we've, we've asked as many questions as we could as we slot them in in the course of this discussion. Uh, we will try to, 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 to go through them even after the webinar. But, uh, you know, as at now, uh, we've got more than 100 people tuning in. And um, thank you so much for really participating. Um, I think this, this really shows, I think this is the galloping that we hear, you know, that professor is saying that people are very curious and people want to um, learn more so that they ask better questions so that they can do more. Um, and in, on that note, uh, thank you so much for participating in, this is the second webinar. Uh, and, and we can't do this without the, uh, without, without the viewers, the audience uh, and the people who engage with us. Can't do this without the volunteers behind the scenes. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a wide array of, law, uh, of, of lawyers and non-lawyers, you know, laypersons uh, from civil society who is uh, really behind this project. Um, and so, uh, you know, forgive us for any shortcomings. Uh, and uh, we are also extremely grateful to 
all our uh, panelists um, um, for spending the time to go through the contents with us and preparing uh, and, and just really uh, making sure that we, within the short time, we, we touch on some of the, the, the most basic things. So thank you so much. In the next week, uh, our next episode, we will be discussing how does the law protect the environment? So, uh, you know, uh, we'll be delving in into how laws give power and authority to the government and government agencies and members of the public to manage how we use the environment. Right. And uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, Lijun, you can touch on who, who will be joining us there. Yeah, joining us, we will have Dr. Ma Wing Kwai, who is the Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, so Hakam, and a former judge of the Court of Appeal. We also have Miss Ivy Wong, uh, who is the lead of the Environment Pillar uh, from Yasan Hassana, as well as the Corporate Responsibility Foundation of Kazada National Berhad. We also have Dr. Bala Murugan, who is the Managing Director of ERE Consulting Group, who has 30 years experience in environmental and natural resource planning and management in the region. So you can find the updates of the speakers and upcoming episodes on the BCE CCC Facebook page. Um, please remember to share, like, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Until we meet again, thank you very much for tuning in. Have a good evening.